Well, thank you for that warm welcome, which I so richly deserve, <laughs> but so seldom get. <clears throat> when I asked Mike what to talk about, he said, speak from your heart. Well, that should take about three minutes because the heart's been transformed so completely, so I actually have an outline. We'll put you through that. But I like anecdotal reference. Uh, I'm a migrant. I came to America with $9 in my pocket in 1986. The first day we were watching the 88 box, the television, I told my bride we were going to make it. She said, why? I said, these people think they have problems. <laughs> Someone asked me, what motivates you? Hot water. Now, growing up, we had running water. If you needed it, you ran and got it. And that's not reasonably far from the truth. Uh, my, my mother was a child bride. My father studied under a streetlight to graduate from college. So those are the beginnings. Uh, I jokingly tell people, we were so poor, we go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, lick other people's fingers. Uh, <laughs> so, but somewhere along the line, <clears throat> we had a chance to come to this great land, put our roots down. And it's ironic that my very first goal was a real estate goal. In 1986, when I landed in America, of course, I never went to school in America except to teach. So I told my wife, I said, sweetheart, why don't we set a goal that four years after we are in this country, we should be earning as much as if we went to school here, and that will be our goal to buy a house. So we lived in literally rundown places, the wrong end of the street and the wrong part of town, uh, drove used cars, and scrimped and saved everything we had. And in 1990, four years after we landed in this country, we built our first little starter custom home in Flower Mound, Texas. But I remember those early days because I'm a politically incorrect guy, as you'll find out as we navigate through this process. I know what some of you are thinking. He looks like the, every guy you'd see at 7-Eleven, and that's true. That's where the beginnings were. Uh, I don't own a motel, uh, that's, uh, so let's get in. I'm not a doctor, so let's get those things out of the way. I'm a salesman, tried and true. I'm a card-carrying member of this profession. I wake up every day morning with prospecting on my heart, not so that I would do well, so that my son would have something to inherit. But I remember the first time we went to a real estate office in those early days saying we're looking for a home. And this lady looked at me and she, see, political correctness is an interesting thing, especially as it comes to success. And you probably find it because the largest percentage of people buying homes now are migrants, and you're probably wondering how you deal with them. Uh, their hopes and dreams are the same. So if you dance around communication and try to pander because you think that's the correct thing to do, you're actually missing out on what their hopes and dreams are. So this lady looked at me and she says, where do you want to live? And I gave her my budgets and all that. And she kept taking me to places which had large percentages of migrants. So I said, I'm seeing a pattern in the way you're trying to find houses for me. She says, oh, I just thought you'd be more comfortable here. She, no, she was not smart enough to be prejudiced. So let's get that out of the way. She just didn't even know what that meant. She was just going with her gut. She was shocked in 1990 when I said to her, I said, ma'am, if I wanted to see Indians, I'd have stayed in India. <laughs> I want to open my window and see a white dude with a Cadillac mowing his yard so I have something to aspire to. So let's get on the right track. Years later, I had the privilege of speaking for that corporation's international symposium in Las Vegas and uh, <clears throat> sharing that story. And the reason I share these things is I'm going to take you through four moods. How do you prepare a life to be one of significance. So raise your right hand for me as high as it'll go. Uh, raise it a wee bit higher. Well, let me just uh, block the, oops. What are we doing here now? Uh, uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, <clears throat> that's good, all right. Right hand as high as it'll go. Now raise it a wee bit higher. Why didn't you do that to begin with? I said as high as it'll go. We all save a little bit for a rainy day that never comes. 97% of the people in this world operate in the comfort zone. 3% of the people in this world operate in the effective zone. The difference between comfort and effectiveness is called growth, and growth is uncomfortable. Now, I'm proud to live in the great state of Texas where there are only three rules for survival. If it's moving, we hug it, hospitable. If it's not, we sell it, industrious. If it argues, we shoot it, just. But in Texas, this syndrome is called the dead armadillo syndrome. You see, I, I've never seen a live armadillo. They're always dead in a 70-mile-an-hour speed zone. And I'm wondering why armadillos occasionally don't have a monthly gathering like this and say, dude, dad died here. Mom died here. Everybody we know died right here. Let's find a school zone.
So today, before we speed up, I want to slow you down to some very simple precepts. Now, that father of mine who studied under a streetlight to graduate from college in 1955 so he could become a shift foreman with an oil refinery, at the age of 81, just received his PhD in a university that's 82 years old. My mother, child bride, married to my dad when she was in the eighth grade. When they celebrated their 60th anniversary, mom was all of 74. Yet at 70, the age of 75, she went back and finished her master's slowly over a period of time. Who you are is different from what you do. If you want to be a three percenter, you have to make some adjustments in terms of what life is and what it is. Now, most people will realize there is something out there that is going on. This is the hard part. There is a cultural rot <laughs> taking place in America that is demotivating the heck out of people. I've lived here 30 years, and I watched a steady decline in the desacralization of values. Now, when you desacralize anything, you begin to redefine it. And when you redefine it, people are just caught up in the mess. They wake up every morning, look in the mirror, and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Do I have a prayer at all? If the mirror ever looked back at you and said, with that kind of hairdo, go back to bed, listen to the mirror. <laughs> if you walk out in this world looking like the picture on your driver's license or like you've been weaned on a pickle, ain't nobody going to treat you like a glamour shot. If you're happy, tell your face. But William Blake, the poet, put it this way when he said, This eyes dim windows off the soul distorts the heavens from pole to pole and goads us to believe a lie when we see with and not through the eye. We're supposed to see through the eye with the conscience, not with the eye devoid of one. So the cultural rot taking place out there is happening on our watch. We have redefined everything and desacralized everything. As a result of it, we are literally, and look how Muggeridge put it, one of the great journalists of our time, he says, the depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable reality, but at the same time, the most intellectually resisted fact. There is a right and a wrong, a good and a bad, a yes and a no, a black and a white. But most people I walk to say, well, it's all relative. Well, they're saying I have lousy relatives. <laughs> a woman will never say, I think I'm relatively pregnant. Nine months from now, she's in for a relative surprise. <laughs> but look what Marguerite goes on to add. He said, so the final conclusion would surely be that whereas other civilizations have been brought down by attacks of barbarians from without, ours had the unique distinction of training its own destroyers at its own educational institutions and then providing them with facilities for propagating their destructive ideology far and wide, all at public expense. Thus did Western man decide to abolish himself, creating his boredom out of his own affluence, his own vulnerability out of his own strength, his own impotence out of his own erotomania, himself blowing the trumpet that brought the walls of his own city tumbling down, and having convinced himself that he was too numerous, labored with pill and scalpel and syringe to make himself fewer until at last, having educated himself into imbecility and polluted and drugged himself into stupefaction, he keeled over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and became extinct. See, the demotivation that we see in our world is our own doing. Now, I have a boy who's 22 years old. He'll graduate from engineering school at uh, the University of Tulsa on 7th of May. Now, his son, my boy, has had to see something very distinct in our lives. See, I'm very, very proud of the dimensional nature in which we live. We are tri-dimensional as a species, mental, physical, and spiritual. Your IQ, EQ, SQ define the real you. Some of these subjects are taboo. People don't talk about them, and as a result, they're constantly frustrated because they're not addressing reality. Think about what I'm saying. I'm talking about the foundation. The foundation. Recently in Columbus, Ohio, late 1999, was one of the first what they call the deconstructivist motto architecture, which means the first postmodernist building. What's a postmodernist building? You understand the term as it pertains to philosophy. You understand the term as it pertains to theology. But what, how does it pertain to architecture? Ravi Zacharias puts it brilliantly when he says he queried the person. What is a postmodernist building? And the guy said, oh, this building has no purpose. The architect says that since life has no meaning, why should we have buildings that have meaning? Deconstructivism. Stairs that go nowhere, rooms that have no functionality, pillars that don't join or support anything. It's brilliant in its concept and very esoteric in the way it's presented. But the question still is bored to ask. Does that building have a foundation? 
And were you as loose with the foundation as you are with the building? And the answer is obviously no. Even though you want to have all that peripheral nonsense, you still have to have a foundation. And when the foundations are lost, everything is lost. So we're seeing stuff at a, what we call contextual level, but we have to look at stuff at the foundational level. Now I'm wearing off my PowerPoint, that's why I blanked it, but this is the thoughts that I want to share with you. What is a foundation? If I brought an architect of any repute and showed them a hole in the ground, with considerable certainty they'll tell me how tall the building's going to be. They're gauging their expertise and staking their reputation on the hole in the ground, which they're saying, if I see the hole, I know how big the foundation is, and if I know how foundation is, I can see how tall the building's going to be. When we look at our own lives, the foundation determines our elevation. Henry David Thoreau said, all of us want to build castles in the air, none of us want to build a foundation on the ground. Foundation is a non-negotiable, and ironically, a lot of people make the foundation a negotiable and the destination non-negotiable. No, it's the opposite. Success is not who you are in relation to the person sitting next to you. Success is who you are in relation to where you began and what you began with. Success is a very personal identity. So at the foundation level, I beg you to ask yourself some questions. If an investigative journalist was asked to discover a story, he'd come up with these questions. Who are you? Where do you come from? Whom do you credit with what you've become? What makes you laugh? What makes you cry? What gives you hope? If people ask me, who are you? I say, I'm Anila's husband and Nick's dad. That was a blessing. Everything else was a choice. Now, I've been married 30 years to that woman of mine, and she's, uh, it's been the best 18 years of her life. <laughs> For the first 12, I had all the answers. They were wrong. Someone asked me one time, how often should I tell my wife I love her? I said, before somebody else does. It's not complicated. That's why in the West we find marriage is grand, divorce is 100 grand. <laughs> See, we have perfected the knowledge of weddings. And there are innumerable shows about weddings. We have failed at the wisdom of marriage. Who are you? What is your identity? Western man, Western woman, we borrow money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like and become someone we can't recognize. And we think we're smart, logically parading through life because we have somehow figured out the answer. If that's the case, quiz me this. Why do drive through ATMs still have their keypad in Braille? If you're convincing me that our progress is that the blind man is making a withdrawal, driving a car, I ain't buying it. And I'm pretty sure his dog can't drive. I have a dog. But conceptually, we have weakened because we don't ask ourselves fundamental questions. Who are you? Where do you come from? I'll always be the little kid from the rural part of southern India. I was speaking in Arizona one time at one of those casino, resort, everything, you know, helicopter, eye test, you know, one of those all-inclusive projects. And I said, as far as Indians go, I'm the real deal. I can't believe a woman actually got upset and got up and started yelling at me. She said, I'm a full-blooded Native American Indian. I said, bully for you. But if you're going to argue with me, you need to come up and make your case. She came up to the front. She thought she had a case till I explained to her historically, Columbus was looking for me. He found her by mistake. <laughs> Where has education gone that allows us to have anger over ignorance? And that seems to be in broad supply. I fly a lot. I've crossed four, four million miles and reaching on American alone. Five million miles on all other airlines combined which means I see ignorance on broad display at airports where people wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to pick up Krish's itinerary and run to the airport and open a can of stupid. <laughs> I've had friends, well-meaning people, walk up to me in the airport. Hey, you're flying somewhere? No, I just come see the planes. What? I mean, what is wrong with people? Here's what's wrong. Political correctness will be the death of civilized motivation. Who are you? Where do you come from? Whom do you credit with the platform upon which you will build a monument to your legacy? Whom do you credit? See, my dad and mom, I talk to them twice a week. We disagree on many things. Religiously, I made a different decision. I subscribe to a different worldview. My parents don't. 
There was a five year period where my dad was angry as heck. He wanted to disown me. He wanted to disinherit me. Fine. Till I told him, I said, Pop, you can make a lot of logical decisions as a father, but you cannot allow me to. You will not prevent me from out loving you into submission. I will out love you. See, love is not an action or an emotion, it's an ethos. We have subscribed to it as an action or an emotion. Somehow in America on Valentine's Day, if you don't give someone else a gift, you're a failure romantically. Like that day had anything to do with life itself. Five times a year, I'm supposed to surprise that bride of mine on Mother's Day, on Valentine's Day, on Christmas, on anniversary, and on birthday. I'm a guy. The odds of me coming up with five surprises for the 50 years we intend to be married, 250 are zero. <laughs> so you go to her and you confess. Give me the privilege of surprising you 15 times in our life together. The rest of the time, just tell me what you want. <laughs> Guys, if a woman says nothing, stop the presses. It means everything. When you ask her what's wrong, nothing's wrong. If nothing is wrong, why? if something's wrong, why don't you say something's wrong? So we have the dialogue. 30 years later, they ask my bride, how can you claim to be married to a man who's been traveling for most of your marriage? My boy was three months old when I hit the road with Mr. Ziegler as his assistant. When I first started carrying his briefcase, nobody knew who I was. At the end of our journey, when I took him to the bathroom because he had Alzheimer's and didn't know who he was, it was my duty. But that's what I did. I left my family and I took the road. Recently at a marriage seminar, my bride said this. She said, our marriage was never designed to be one of proximity. It was ordained to be one of example. See, unless we learn to love each other in each other's absence, we will never be able to surprise each other in each other's presence. Whom do you credit with that legacy? What is your inner circle? Don't let every Tom, Dick, and Harry come into that inner circle, people who rain on your parade. Have you ever noticed some people are so narrow-minded they look through a keyhole with both eyes? You've also noticed people with nothing to do generally want to do it with you. And here's the doozy. You've also noticed some people brighten up a whole room by leaving. <laughs> but why then do we, because we don't, see we have too many people raining on our parade. Who are the non-negotiables? So where do you come from? Who are you? What's your foundation? Question four, what makes you laugh? The one thing I find fascinating is uh, America's got more food than any other country in the world. Most number of people on a diet. I tried the 30-day diet, lost a month. We got more marriage counselors per capita than any other country in the world, highest rate of divorce. Yet when you go to the bank, they chain the pen to the counter. Nobody ever steals the bick. <laughs> common sense is not common practice. And because of this, I see laughter in short supply. Everybody walking around looking at the picture on their driver's license, like someone's licked all the red off their candy. You know, if we look like the cruise director for the Titanic, nobody's going to be happy with you, right? You gotta, I gotta have some fun. Put a little pep in your step, a little bounce to your rounds. And I love to laugh. And I go, I've been delayed many times in airports, and I will find people who are upset with life and tell them, hey, listen, Quit yelling at the only person in the airport who can't fly a plane. They go to that poor gal standing behind the counter and keep yelling at her about the imbecility of the airline. Nobody talks to the captain that way. You say, get off my bird. What makes you laugh? For me, watching human behavior makes me laugh. I was in the airport standing behind a lady. Now, I don't use profanity. Uh, spiritually, I try not to, and uh, culturally, I don't think it's important. But... I try to create words that will give you the idea of what I'm saying. This lady was acting like a equine posterior. <clears throat> she was arguing with the flight attendant about the fact that she didn't need to produce her ID because she was a celebrity. Post 9-11 world, I tapped her on the shoulder and said, ma'am, on Thursdays, all of us celebrities have to show our ID. She said, who are you? I said, Gandhi. So if someone has to tell you who you are, you ain't. So at the foundation level, who are you? Where do you come from? Uh, whom do you credit? What makes you laugh? What makes you grieve? For me, the loss of innocence makes me grieve. And I think that's one of the things that I, 
I find most painful in my journeys. Now, folks, I've traveled to 60 countries on six continents. I've spoken to roughly over 3 million people in my time. Six books later and all of that, I don't claim any of those accolades. What I do claim is the emails I get of absolute brokenness from around the world that are the easiest problems to solve. This morning, I got an email from a person saying, I, I, I'm in business with my husband. Uh, we, we believe in a lot of the same things. But how do we, and I just responded to her. I said, unless you establish boundaries. And then I suddenly caught myself as I was writing the email and I said, before you give her advice, try not to be a hypocrite. So I started by saying, I said, you would be better off asking my bride this question than me. And I gave her email address, to which I got a response. She says, you're the first person who didn't answer my question, but actually did. See, that because unless the thought is there, watch me carefully, every idea you have, every thought you have manifests into ideas you, you capture. Ideas become habits. Habits become behavior. Behavior becomes character, and character shapes destiny. The very way you think alters the outcome. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. The whole NLP movement says, you know, you become what you think. No, if you became what you think, every, th every teenage boy would be a girl. <laughs> okay? You don't become what you think. That's ridiculous. But your thoughts begin to manifest and habits and behaviors begin to coalesce and character begins to reveal itself and destiny begins to appear. When passion is born, you get a glimpse of your potential, not the other way around. But a lot of people saying, well, I'm waiting for all my ducks to line up. Well, all your ducks line up, you have a lot of ducks. Doesn't mean anything. Many of you have been to the Peabody Hotel, I think is what it's called in Arkansas, where they bring out ducks in the evening and everybody line up. Lowest common denominator of excitement that we got ducks to walk in a row with a bow tie. I don't know why we line up next to the fountain to watch ducks march with some dude with a stick. I said, you know, that's progress. Turn it around. Have a bunch of dudes in a bow tie being marched along with a duck with a stick. I'll watch that. By the same token, see, because our, our images are all confused and convoluted, and that's why we don't understand a lot of the simple stuff that's available. They say if a frog becomes a prince, that's a fairy tale. But if a tadpole becomes a human being, that's science. Confusing. Where are we getting our self-image from? See, in the 50s, we lost our innocence. In the 60s, we lost our authority. In the 70s, we lost our ability to love. In the 80s, we lost our ability to reason. In the 90s, we lost our ability to hope. In the year 2000 and beyond, we've lost imagination. Culturally, we are a byproduct, as Muggeridge said. Muggeridge said there is no new news. It's just old news happening to new people. See, as a migrant, I've figured this out. Because I used to ask more questions than I was seeking answers. I asked my hero, Zig Ziglar, Mr. Z, simplify it for me. He said, son, unless you have something to look up to, unless you have something to stand on, and unless you have something to lean on, life will be difficult. Life is tough, but if you're tough on yourself, life will become infinitely easier for you. When he was looking up, he was saying, have a God to look up to. When he was talking about foundation, have a country to be proud of. When you have something to lean on, have a family that supports you. See, that same boy of mine who that bride has raised, no thanks to me, I've never been there. When he went to college, he wrote, the most influential person in my life is my dad. How can that be? I've never been there. By, by the media, I'm an absentee father. My wife should have been a statistic, should have been a ward of support from somebody. No, she's the longest married single woman I ever knew. But when I read my boy's essay, my heart broke. He says, the reason I picked my dad even though I have missed him. He's never been at any game. When I won the international uh, design competition for robotics in 93 countries in Anaheim, my father was in a tent in India preaching. Of course I missed him, but the reason I picked him is because 
his undenying love for his maker and his unending faith in my mother. If I can have that kind of love for family and that kind of foundation in faith, my life should be okay. I asked him, how could a person of 18 have that brilliance? And you know what he said? He says, Pop, you don't know this, but I've, I go through a lot of separation with my, my friends have to decide where they're going to spend Thanksgiving. And I just go to bed every night knowing because you love mom, I'll never have to make the decision. How simple is that? See, we make it complicated because when we fail, we can blame the system, the person, the process, the protocol. And Reagan. <laughs> For whatever reason, everything, that's the catch-all. Apparently, he's the biggest problem of all. So foundation, ask yourself. So the last question in foundation is, where are we going to get the hope now that I've laid out the plan? Hope, Alfred Adler said, hope is the foundational quality of all change. John Maxwell said if there's hope in the future, there's power in the present. So how are we going to coalesce? How are we going to garner this hope? Let's look at where we are as a, as a group. The world right now is boundaryless, which means I do business globally. This year alone, I've been in India already. We're producing a movie there on the life of Graham Staines, a missionary who was murdered in India. I'll go back to India in a couple of weeks. After that, the month after that, I'll be in Korea. The month after that, I'll be in England. And then I'll go to Singapore. And then I'll go to Bangkok. And that's just June. The travel here is equally horrendous. This year, I've already been in Indianapolis. I've been in Seattle. I've been in, I was just came back from Florida. I don't even count the domestic trips. 150, 180, 200,000 miles on this body. The world is boundaryless. But Mr. Ziegler said, everybody in this world wants the same eight things, to be happy, to be healthy, to be reasonably prosperous. I know some of you want to be unreasonably prosperous, and that's okay. I've had money, I haven't had it. Overall, it's better to have it. Money is not everything, but it ranks reasonably close to oxygen. When you need it, there is no substitute. See, money bought me a house. Actually, it bought me two. It will never buy me a home with laughter. Money bought me a good time. It will never buy me peace of mind. It bought me a companion. Won't buy me a friend. Bought me a good time. Won't buy me peace of mind. I like the things money will buy. But I love the things money won't buy. You can get everything in this world that money will buy without a lick of character. But you cannot get any of the things that money won't buy without that character. So if you want to be happy, healthy, reasonably prosperous, have friends, security, peace of mind, good family relationships and hope, you have to understand. How did F.W. Borum put it? The world is a wide and open place. And if you want to experience, and I'm paraphrasing, if you want to experience everything that the world has, you have to be sampling that which you would do anything to avoid and avoid those things that you've already sampled. <laughs> what was he talking about? Intellect. If you want to experience the boundaryless bounty of this world, you need to bring into your arsenal that which is good, clean, pure, powerful, and positive. Change what you've been reading. Change your input. Uh, and I know this, what I'm about to say won't go down well in the South. Stop listening to country western music. <laughs> Nothing is more demotivating on the planet, and I had the privilege of being on a program with Garth Brooks for Walmart. I shared this with him. He said, no, I made a lot of money doing this, but this is, I mean, think about the lyrics. My wife ran away with my best friend, and I sure do miss him. <laughs> or you're the reason our kids are ugly. How about this doozy? If I'd shot her then, I'd be out by now. See, these are things that communicate really well. But in a boundaryless world, put into your mind inputs that are good, clean, pure, powerful, and positive. Every day on the way to work, I listen to podcasts, either on psychology, either on philosophy, on behavior, on sales, on customer service, on leadership for the teams I have. On the way home, I listen to information on parenting, on relationships. I do marriage seminars, and I still listen to information on marriage after 30 years. My parents have been married 60. I asked my dad for his advice. He's old school. He says, Dad, son, every time I fought with your mom, I took a walk. He says, I'm up to nine miles a day and in the best shape of my life. So that's a different old school. My bride's smarter than I am. She went to the same business school as I did. 
when she quit her job to stay home with Nick, she was making more money than I am. I prayed for her to be modern enough that won't affect my lifestyle. If she continued working, I'd have a pretty good gig. We'd probably have two German cars in the driveway now. She's smarter than I am. But that comes with realizing that information has to be constant. University of Southern California did a study. They said in your automobile, if you're listening to information and you drive 12,000 miles a year on average in any metropolitan area, within the span of three years, you could get the equivalent of two years of college in your car as a passive listener. They call this automobile university. Don't just sit there to get there. Sit there to arrive more informed. Clients, customers, everybody is getting smarter, are you? How do we cope with our children? Same thing. When my kid is in the car with me when he was younger, when he said something that was profound or I thought needed his attention, I would pull off to the side and said, son, can you repeat that? That is sheer brilliance. And I would take a notepad and write it down. His eyes would light up. Did I ever use it? I don't know. But for that moment, it mattered. So boundaryless. Then we are a modular world. Create pockets of excellence. Wherever you are, be there. Most people at work are always thinking of home. Most people at home are always thinking of work. Can't get anything done either place, traveling between the two. Everybody I've ever met is too busy to stop. Here's why. You're confusing activity with accomplishment. <laughs> John Henry Fabre, a French naturalist, did a study with processionary caterpillars, so named, because you put them on the edge of a flower pot. They went round and around for, nine day, for six days and six nights till they literally drop dead out of exhaustion and starvation. Six inches from them in the center of that flower pot was pine needles, their favorite food. How can you go for six days and six nights and die when your favorite sustenance is six inches away? That's when he came up with this thing. Human beings are like processionary caterpillars. We confuse activity with accomplishment. Keeping the main thing the main thing is always harder. I had the privilege. I met Mother Teresa in 1994. I gave her a donation. More than anything else, I wanted a picture with her. Why? Digital posterity. Put it up on my wall, and then people can come and kiss my ring, as Frank Sinatra would say. <laughs> there is no such thing as piety with proxy. You are not going to be self-righteous because someone else goes to church. <laughs> You're not going to be righteous because someone else tells the truth. The biggest weapon, they say today, is not the bomb. The biggest weapon today is the truth, and that's the one thing being hidden from everybody. Create pockets of excellence and make yourself modular. When I asked Mother Teresa for a picture, she said, I don't do this for publicity, and I'm thinking, I do. Came back to Dallas, mailed her a letter, thanked her for the privilege. She had given me some stuff to do, which I finished. She sent me a picture in the mail of her holding a child. The picture wasn't with me, but the words were for me. She says, Dear Krish Dunham, say yes to the least of humanity. By picking up those most deserving in the eyes of a loving God, you will have participated in the greatest good of all. Love, Mother Teresa. Sits on my nightstand as a reminder of who you are and whose you are. That was the day our desire was born to start a foundation. Didn't happen that year, but in 2008, my bride and I started a ministry where five times a year I go to India and put on events like this for the people who will never have the privilege of coming to a nice place to hear stuff like this. But it was based on her words. See, the whole concept of relativism is the biggest crock. Aldous Huxley, the big postmodern child, said this. He said, I want my life to have no purpose. Then I can continue to participate in my own erotic dysfunction. We want to stretch boundaries and redefine stuff, not because we are progressive. How did Chesterton put it? He says, the greatest problem of all is not the problem that we are weary with pain. The greatest problem is we are weary of pleasure. We are running out of things to excite ourselves. So we are creating games to continue to stay relevant. And Chesterton wrote this in 1905. This guy actually influenced C.S. Lewis. But it's amazing how, you know, a country that was formed on a Judeo-Christian bent on bent knee where people stood in front of Congress and prayed, today we cannot, and I'm not talking theologically. Someone asked me this question the other day. They said, are you really spiritual? I said, spirit is different, but there are three things I know. One, there is a God. Two, it ain't me. Three, it ain't you either. <laughs> Common sense has gone by the wayside. Um, and I'll show you, we have become creatures of reaction versus response. Raise your right hand like this. 
Uh, put it slowly on your chin. See, for those of you who miss, the chin is this pointed thing at the end of the face. <laughs> yeah, and the reason is, some of you got it, some of you didn't, but the reason we do that is you're so cap captured in what I'm saying, trying to process it, that we somehow become spectators and we react to stuff we see instead of responding to that which we believe. Reaction is based on life's possibles. Response is based on your permissibles. And we are reactionary as a species. We're not proactive. Here's the thing, because we think life is a popularity contest. Folks, if it was, you'd lose. <laughs> Life's not a popularity contest. When I'm done, some of you will like me, I'll have motivated you. Some of you will dislike me, I'll have knocked you off balance. Three of you will steal my jokes and use them as your own. That's despicable. But I can't do anything about it. Life goes on. This is already, I think, the, what, maybe the 27th talk I've done this year? I'll do 120 by the time the year is over, and I give you my permission to cancel my presentation. It's what I do. You will never get my permission to cancel my day. It's who I am. This is a modular part. It's what I do. As soon as I get here, I'll call my bride. I'll say, hey, we finished another one. Thanks for giving me the privilege to get on the road all those years ago. We'll probably have a lunch date. I think she's doing a Bible study at church. At least that's the plan. Something else could go back in between. That's fine. Life goes on. And finally, virtual. Do you know why one uh, guy tweeted this? Uh, his name skips me, but do you know why we call it a selfie? Because this generation is so lazy they can't even spell narcissistic. <laughs> because, and I'm on all social media, that's how I stay connected with multitudes of people across the globe, but I find it fascinating that there is no misery on Facebook. Everybody goes to the best church, has the nicest pastor, is married to the sweetest woman for the longest time with the nicest kids. By for crying out loud, they also have the best dog. Where is the misery then? Where's the 55 to 60 percent of people who are not living together and the 75 percent of people who don't have a dad in the house? Where are they? Because the virtual world has created a fantasy that everybody wants to say, hey, Look at me, don't leave me out of this. Folks, let me remind you of the great causation of living. If you want to, you can be lonely, but you're never alone. You still have your thoughts. How many of you talk to yourself? I see, I'm gonna give you permission to answer yourself, but if you're arguing with yourself, you may need professional help, but we all talk to ourselves. Here's the irony, 77% of self-talk is negative. 77% of all illnesses are psychosomatic. Coulda, woulda, shoulda, hesitation hill. If it was easy, somebody else would have got it. Woe is me, pity party, P-L-O-M, poor little old me disease. We need to take a step back and ask ourselves, how come during the heart of the depression, some people were playing golf at the country club? Jim Rohn, uh, who was a business philosopher who passed away, was, was, was talking to his mentor, Earl Shove, and Earl asked him, how come you're only making so much? He says, that's all they'll pay. He says, no, that's all they'll pay you. <laughs> Are they paying others? Find out a way to get a bigger percentage of the pie. That's capitalism. The other extreme is communism, and we think that somehow we can compete the two. No, capitalism has always been the uneven distribution of wealth. <laughs> communism will always be the even distribution of misery. But somehow we think there's a great utopia out there and someone out there is going to solve our problem. No, they are not. They're about as clueless as we are. If you put one foot in boiling hot water and the other foot in ice cold water, on average, you're miserable. You're not balanced. See, that's a crock that's been paraded down that said, no, they, are, they will always be winners and they will always be losers. Seven billion on planet Earth, there's a reason there's only one you. We tried our best to have this unified thought that in the great by and by it's all equal. It was never designed to be equal. And believe me, you know, as a migrant, I know that. I was speaking in the, for the Department of Defense or one of those big agencies that exist. And I fly a lot. And I'm a pragmatist. I'm not very emotional about a lot of decisions. So I looked at them and I said, guys, I've been flying a lot on the airplane, the lines and all that kind of screwy. I think you need to start profiling. They looked at me like, 
why would someone who looks like you say that? Because if you look at the Homeland Security, the department definition of a terrorist is someone who's about 6'1 with facial hair. Ta-da! So why would someone like me make that claim? I said, sir, if you start profiling, that line will be shorter and I'll be in it. <laughs> See, your random desire to create equality has only created stupidity and it's time to stop the insanity. And believe it or not, these old curmudgeons started clapping because I told them what they had felt. Now, is that such an ugly word? No, that's reality. I travel a lot. I was flying from uh, Manila to Doha on Qatar Airways. I'd done 14 events in Manila. I was dead tired. I'd preached my heart out. I was flat on my back, fast asleep, eye shades on, you know, the typical up in the air moment. And she suddenly shakes me awake. Emergency, emergency. We... So I wake up and I said, is it personnel or mechanical? She says, I don't care. Just put your seat up. And we had to land in Bangkok. A passenger had died. It made his last flight. But when we got back in the air, she came to me. She said, sir, I've been an airline attendant for 25 years. That's the first time I woke anybody up from a dead sleep who came up and said, is it personal or mechanical? I said, ma'am, I made peace with my maker. I just wanted to know if I was praying for myself or someone else on the way down. And I had the opportunity to talk to her, calm her down, and share with her some of the truths of life. But it takes an ability, see, who, who, that identity that non-negotiable self, that 3% thinking. Yesterday ended with last night. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. That's a different mindset. Real quick. This is the generation that Gary Hamill calls Generation F. So this is some of the folks we are dealing with. All ideas require equal footing. And what I'll do is I've sent Tanya the email. I mean, she has this PowerPoint with her. If you want this information, just ask her and she'll give it to you. I do not believe, I have no copyright issues. Uh, I have copy wrong issues, so if I give it to you, I know you'll have copied it right. So that way, you know, don't try to write it down and then give the Indian credit for it, okay? So she'll send it to you and think, but. Tasks are chosen, not assigned. Leaders are people, power comes from within. If you look at some of what this, this world operates in now, it's completely different to anything I was raised with. We have helicopter parents who come in and out of the lives of the kids. Now they are lawnmower parents, new classification. You know what this doozy is? This principal of a school got a call from a mother who says that I can't believe you gave my kid a C. He says, well, that assignment deserved a C. She says, no, it didn't. I did the assignment. It, I, I think it was an A. <laughs> if that's our level of operational capability, we are raising a generation of people who we have designed will lead us, but we put them there. And you're saying, well, Chris, that's a stretch. Do you really believe lawnmower parenting is a stretch? In any suburb in Dallas alone, I can, I can sit in a parking lot and watch people exit their car with their children and tell you who's doing that. See, a child who will get out of the car and wait for the parent understands authority and hierarchy. <laughs> when my son was born, I said, here's the non-negotiable. You can insult me, you will never insult your mother. She's my woman. I said, you will never use the Lord's name in vain. I have very few rules. Why? When my son sees me bow down to an authority, I have earned the right to ask him to bow down to me. I brought him into this world. Where's the authority? Somewhere along the line, we, we started. See, Adrian Rogers put it best when he said, uh, anything with no head is dead and anything with two heads is a freak. Where's our hierarchy gone? I was in the airport in, uh, in uh, Fort Walton Beach on Monday, coming back after an engagement, and I saw this child. I mean, I have never seen such a display of absolute disrespect. The mother had bought a drink and told the child to wait, and this kid was probably 10 or 12. I think they were on their way to Dr. Phil because that's the only place I've seen that. <laughs> Open it, wait. Open it, wait. Went back and forth. He started pushing her in an airport. My father's board of education would have met my seat of learning much earlier than that. An army man stood up and he said, excuse me, ma'am, do I have permission to intervene? She said, I, I've tried everything. And she started crying. 
and he took the kid to the side and said, young man, that is the most disrespectful, and he was a towering army guy. The kid withered out of that, made his excuses, apologized to his mother, seven minutes later started it again. Now, when my son threw a tantrum, and he did, he's not, you know, that's what kids do. But when my kid did a tantrum, I followed Dr. Dobson's there to discipline. I picked him up and hugged him closer to me than anything else on the planet. I took him away from that place and I said, you're going to be angry, but there's nothing I, you can do that will make me stop loving you. But I had to remove you from there because those people did not pay to see this. And I removed him from the store and we sat on the bench till he was done. What did my son remember from all his tantrums? That he got a closer hug saying, nothing will make me stop loving you. Bill Glass says the reason we're having, folks, I've done prison ministry for 25 years. I know of what I talk. We'll never solve the crime problem in America till we solve the father-son problem. Bill Glass tells the story of how Jim Sundberg, former All-Pro for the Cleveland, for the Kansas City Royals, was in a prison speaking, and he was telling this inmate, he says, man, my dad used to motivate me, and my dad said, Jimmy, you, Sonny, you keep doing this, and one day you'll catch in the majors. And the prisoner said, Mr. Sunberg, I'm exactly where my father said I'd be. You keep doing this, you'll end up in jail. Zig Ziglar wrote a book, Raising Positive Kids in a Negative World. See, this is, we need to compete for this generation because they are the future. They are not 100% of the problem, but they are 100% of the future. And we owe it to them. Vital, all right? Is this stuff making sense or don't you care? <laughs> Okay, let me go to this. The science of performance and then I'll hush. I'll open it up for some questions, maybe even answer a few. By the way, if you disagreed with anything, I say just slap the person next to you. I'll know you're upset and we can deal with it later. <laughs> but I call this the doses of performance, the doses of interaction. This is what you get for telling me to speak what's on my heart, Mike. <laughs> Learn to be dynamic. Someone who has fluidity for new things. I shared the example of my father. Uh, I cannot tell you what pride it gives me that at 75 he went back and got his master's. At 77 he petitioned the university for a seat on the PhD program and they said, no, why should we give it to you? And he wrote a 50-page dossier of his life from the streetlight to chairman and managing director of three companies and said, if anyone in this town has earned a right, look at what my kids have done, look at what my bride has done, I have earned the right. They said, we can't give you a seat, you're so old. He said, what should I do? They said, take the entrance test. He came number one in the entrance test because he had time on his hand. When I found out that's what my father was doing, I said, man, what a privilege I have. I'm one of the few people alive who's buying my father and my son textbooks at the same time. <laughs> How cool is that? Be organized. Now, organized, I don't mean having a list. A, B, C, D, time management, goal setting. You guys have done that ad nauseum. I'm talking about something the exact opposite. I'm going to teach you a principle. Learn to do the most disagreeable thing first. <laughs> As this boy from Alabama said, if you have to swallow a frog, you don't want to look at that sucker too long. <laughs> He's not going to get prettier. You've got to give someone the bad news, get it out of the way. Don't let it rain on your parade at the end of the day. Then it'll rob you of all the victories you could have had. Get the negative stuff out of the way. Do the most disagreeable thing first. Second, uh, third, be sensitive. Uh, and sensitivity is not a sign of weakness. That's been paraded down. I'm an anti-culture crusader. I do this all over the world. And you talk about going into places like Egypt and some parts of the Middle East where some of the rhetoric I give is going to resonate. No, it doesn't. I've been, folks, I've been actually in a secluded spot broadcast on television in Iran. They don't, have, they don't have drive broadcasts there. So a lot of the people actually come and watch this person's broadcast from surrounding countries on satellite. He does, he does a church service for these guys and they dress up in their Sunday best and sit in front of the television. That's their service. And I've actually had the privilege of sharing two messages on family and faith and values. I've been in hostile environments, but I will, I will swear till the day I finish that unless you learn how to be sensitive and understand others' point of view, but you have to be confident that what you believe, you believe. If, see, Dr. King said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. 
Most of us go with the flow. If you let someone else row your boat, they're going to take it to where they want to go, not where you want to go. So you have to be firm in your trajectory, but you have to be sensitive to be willing to accept other people's worldview. Now, I'm an apologist by training. That doesn't mean I go around apologizing, but the word apologist comes from apologia, logos meaning word. I defend my faith in the academy. Uh, and if you know, there's a guy by the name of Dr. Ravi Zacharias, considered one of the foremost apologists of our time. In fact, I just got an email from him today. He travels to all the hostile parts of the world. I'm going to be in Korea with him. I said something about, hey, Mr. Dr. Z, I had uh, mentioned your name in an event somewhere, and someone recognized you. I just want to let you know thank you for your influence. And I got an email from him. Thank you, dear friend. This is the hardest time in my 40 years of itinerant ministry to be in airports. See, he was in an airport yesterday in Europe. You have to believe what you believe, but you have to be sensitive that other people are going to derail you. Effective, we talked about that. And lastly, strong will. Be firm, but fair. Now, <clears throat> when I talk about firm, but fair, I probably gave you an illustration for the last 44 minutes or so I've been flapping my gums. I, I, I don't take a lot of prisoners in what I do. In fact, I was speaking in a prison in Nashville, Tennessee, and the guy asked me a question. He says, how can you be so sure of what you say? I said, I can be so sure because I'm talking about goals, and I'm pretty sure you set a goal to get here. <laughs> he says, how can it be? I don't want to be here. I said, well, what did you do that got you here? If you peel the onion back, you will realize that every action has a reaction. Every choice has an outcome. He says, oh, it was purely an accident. I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. I said, that's impossible. Unless you were at the wrong place at the wrong time and the old lady whose bag you stole put it in your hand, <laughs> I'm not buying it. He says, no, but I'm a victim of circumstance. See, I said, now what we're doing is, see, everybody in the bookmark life have a chapter marked excuse already written. <laughs> now, fairness, I met a guy in a prison one time. He's been in and out of prison for the last 35 years, and he came to me absolutely devastated. He said, I have a boy of 14 who won't talk to me. I said, he can't talk to you. You're not a father. You sired him. Huge difference. <laughs> and he says, what then is the solution? I said, now we're talking. I said, every Saturday, I know you get a call. Pick up the phone, call him, and say, I'm sorry, and I love you. He said, he'll hang up. I said, he should. 18 months later, I was back in the same prison. This guy is now leading the charge to give me a hug. Mr. D, there's hope. Mr. D, there's hope. My boy, talk to me. What did he say? Why? One word, gave this man hope. He'll never get out. What he's done, he shouldn't get out. But he's looking for some semblance of reality in this world. You have to be firm, but fair. Love matters. It will win. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pause for some questions, comments, snide remarks. Uh, we'll try to answer some of them, and then I'll hand you back to Mike so you can get the good stuff in life and forget this last hour. Well, he, yeah, but he won, the, he won the World Series with Kansas City. But he's a Texas boy. Yeah, that's, that's a stretch. That's like saying you're an Indian, why don't you talk about cowboys? Well, you know why we don't do that. So, <laughs> so it's like, no, but yeah, you're right. He played for the Texas Rangers, and that's where I met him at Fellowship of Christian Athletes. But when he tells the story, he says, well, I mean, he won the World Series with, no. If you come to my house, one of my prior possessions is I got an Oral Hershiser signed baseball with John 316, and I got a Jim Sundberg signed baseball with John 316. So, <laughs> yeah. How would you help another person in similar life when it is tough? Okay. Um, yeah. The first. You're not, you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. Okay. Now, now you're a mother. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I, work, I work alone, all right? So, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I had this uh, with, with a mother by, uh, by the name of Kristen Joseph. She's given me permission to tell the story. But when her daughter turned 13, 14, going to the adolescent years, going through some of the physiological changes, rebellion, 
she came to one of the events we produced here. And I said, Debbie, your daughter doesn't need a buddy. Okay? There's, a, there's that issue I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of moms with teenagers, they think they're, they're vicariously living their youth, guys do it with their kids, but we're trying to be their buddy, we're not. They, they need, there's a difference between a girl and a lady, and mothers need to become ladies. They need to be women, uh, and not girl talk. <laughs> that's, that's, that's television, that doesn't work in reality because we want them to do all the things and have a good life and all of that other stuff, but then we stay in the couch, we're facing the front door till they come home. I know what that's like. First thing, second thing I would do is, as I taught Debbie and Christian to do, I would write letters, notes of encouragement to her, simple, uh, but specific behavior. This is something we used to do at Ziegler, which was very popular. We would write, thank you, or, uh, Watch specific observable behavior and write an affir affirming note to that and put it in a place where they will get it when you're not there. Which means your praise is not coming to them as some kind of flattery in conversation. It's coming to them at a moment when they might be lonely and they open it and say, okay, in my absence, mom thinks such highly things of me. But it has to be specific and behavior. Don't tell them they are beautiful because their idea of beauty is different from what Madison Avenue portrays. I was with a mom on a flight from Salt Lake City back to Dallas, and she was bawling her eyes out. I asked her what was wrong. She said, I'm a failure as a mother. I said, no, you can fail at things. You can't fail as someone God loves you too much. She said, I just dropped off my daughter in an eating disorder clinic. And there's a reason for that. Someone gave that girl a, a, an idea of perfection. Perfection doesn't exist. That's advertising. So we cannot compliment DNA qualities when we're talking to our children because their idea of these compliments vary. Someone is always prettier, someone has got nicer clothes, someone has got a nicer house. It has to be behavior qualities. That's what we can influence. And that's important. This mother pouring her heart out for three hours on the flight, I mean, it was, you know, I jokingly tell people, I said, ladies, zero is not a size, it's not even a number. <laughs> the only time I believe someone on the whole issue of Size is when I see Miss America. Because when she says, if I win, I want to eliminate world hunger, I trust her. She's participated in it. <laughs> but because other than that, it's not real. Okay, so make sure that when we talk to our children, we do not give them compliments on beauty. You're so beautiful on the inside. Well, that, that's going to backfire like a boomerang. What we need to say is, thank you for the job you did around the house. You're just showing real maturity in the way you're handling those things. Find ways to compliment on behavior because they're looking for worthiness in who they are. And sometimes we, we don't know how to define that and we want to take on their problems. My boy went through it too. Uh, so that's one way I would do it. Then pick up raising positive kids in a negative world. There's a chapter in that book called Love is spelled T-I-M-E, time. Time is not quality time or quantity time. It's the minutes that count. I text my boy twice a week now. You're mine and I love you. You're terrific and I'm proud of you. I don't expect a text back. My boy needs, his mom deals with the boundaries. She's the disciplinarian. But I need to be in his life from a respect perspective. But I don't want to crowd him. Because, you know, when we have a call with our son, if it's an hour, she'll speak for 58 minutes, I'll speak for two minutes, and then the entire week I hear what her 58 minutes was. Uh, I know how that works. And my boy understands that. He knows dad's not going to crowd him, but dad loves him. But my, fa my job as a father, guys, listen to me. Do not let your children walk around with a hole in their heart where your blessing should be. Bless your children. Once a month I send to my son by text, Son, I may never gather diamonds, I may never amass gold. My colleagues may consider me a failure when my business life is told. But if you can grow up godly, my boy, I'll be glad, for I know I'll have been successful as your dad. Create something like that with your daughter. And make sure your affirmations, two things, make sure your affirmations are consistent, but they're true. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, what I'll do is, the question was, do I maintain a list of resources? I have a six to eight page PDF, and I'll see what they do in the office on it. Shelly updates it constantly. But uh, I'll, I'll give uh, my office uh, admin, Shelly, Tanya's email address. And 
we'll send out the bibliography of resources that's on this list, plus all the quotes and stuff I use. So it'll come to you as a, as a PDF document that's about five or six pages long, and then you can refer from there. From a leadership perspective, a great resource I'll give you right now is called breakfastwithfred.com. Fred Smith was an amazing man, passed away in his 90s. His daughter Brenda maintains the website. But Fred was one of the most wise people. He was the mentor to Zig Ziglar, John Maxwell, Bill Glass, and others. So breakfastwithfred.com has his life's work chronicled and categorized. It's a great place to start. But my bibliography that I'll send you will be the books I've read, current updates, all of that stuff. So we'll get that to you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Uh, the <clears throat> one of the things that, but you have to take them to environments where they see influential men. See, this is the hard part. It's not a time issue. You need to get them to place where where men are talking about discipline. Uh, there's an organization right here which I'm on the board, advisory board, but it's called Men of Honor and Women of Honor. It's run by Tony Rory, uh, and Tony basically deals with a lot of these issues. So there are resources out there, but you have to take them to places where strong, family-oriented men. Now remember what I, this is not a guilt trip. Life happens. Not everybody can, Carl Bard said, none of us can go back and make a brand new beginning, but all of us can start now and make a fantastic ending. That's what this is about. This is about giving ourselves hope and not beating ourselves up for stuff that's happened. So what can we do? Take them to think. Make sure that they see that influence um, when I was traveling, what I did was, my best friend is Sonny Gant. Sonny would go pick up my son and take him and play tennis, take him to eat ice cream. Now, I trusted Sonny in the sense that people would always say, well, you know, that's really hard. I don't want a man going into my house. Well, I said, that means you have trust issues with the woman you've left behind. That's a whole, you know, forget the kid. You've got other problems you've got to deal with. People always ask me, do you ever worry? I said, no. The amount of, trouble, amount of effort it's taken to keep one marriage going, I'm never going to stray. God, that's got to be ridiculously hard. I'm not going to do that again. So, and I jokingly tell people, if that woman ever leaves me, I'm going with her. I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> but that's important because he has to see that. So if there are no influential men, quote influential men. Try to find TV shows. And they are. They do exist. Try to find books of influence. Um, C.S. Lewis, who wrote Narnia, great. I mean, man was single all his life. But a great, you know, his book on, you know, joy is pretty remarkable. So the, there are things to do. Buy the book, Dare to Discipline. Dobson talks about it in there. So you had a question, Mike? Yeah. What would you say to... Um, How am I doing on time? Okay. You're good. To, you know, just the, the agent in here who's dealing with that tension between trying to, to balance work and family. Okay. And just, you know, almost like you said, being a family, feeling like you should be at work, being at work, feeling like you should See, your average billionaire has the same number of hours, 24, okay? None, none of us can change the number of hours we have. But trust me on this, okay? Value is in the doer, not the deed. We are a deed-based society. That's where we think balance is impossible. We think balance is I spend 12 hours at work. If that's what you do, that's what you do. I've been gone most of my son's life. But my wife always told him, this is what dad does. Most people communicate, commute at 8 and come back at 5. Dad communicates at 8 and comes back at Thanksgiving. Okay, that's just the role. But value is in the, Dennis Waitley said, value is in the doer, not the deed. As families, as units, as agents, as people who run multiple parts of your existence, remember that. If we focus on the deed, we become hourly. We have to focus on the value that we get to do it at all and make that one hour count. Now, how, how do you do it? You do it by communicating. The greatest resource is digitally at your disposal. You can communicate with the ones you love and achieve balance by not being around them a majority of the time, by making sure that you tell them where you are, tell them what you're doing. But number one rule, always give them credit for the fact that you get to do it. That allows the togetherness to exist in behavior. Very vital. But they're simple things. Um, I can tell you without any fear of error, I probably text that bride of mine at least 20 times a day. 
and 19 of them have nothing to do with life. Hey, remember that time we had that stupid name we called our dog, what was it? Now with my son, when he was growing up, he's a technology guy, I'm not. I'm fairly decent at it, but I, pr I acted like an ignoramus around him as far as technology was concerned. So I always bought the same phone he had. I would always ask him to buy me my electronics so I could call him and ask him how to configure them. <laughs> and that's his wheelhouse, so he felt, oh, dad does all these talks, he's a dummy, he doesn't even know how to program his iPhone. I know, I'm just encouraging him to feel that part of my life. So the constancy that the digital footprint, now that's also Generation F, they don't believe they need to punch in a clock or come into the house when they're connected. Now most parents argue saying that I bought my child a phone but they never answer it. Uh, that's a takeaway rule. As long as you're paying for it, they will answer it. I don't expect them to answer every text, but I expect them to tell me where they are and who they are with. Coming back may be option depending on their age. Trust is a key part. But we always made our house the cool house. Don't try to live in a museum and expect the child to treat it like home. If you want the house to be neat and their kids, their friends can't come there, uh, Mr. Ziegler put it best when he said, would it be easier to have them in your house drinking Coke than in someone else's snorting it? So you have to, so we always told our boy, he was the first to get a license. Son, if you're out there gallivanting at 11 o'clock, and I know all of you apparently get bored at the witching hour, it's like Cinderella, you think you're gonna become a pumpkin. Everybody thinks that, you know, I'm bored. I don't know why they get bored at 11.59 and why not at seven when everybody's awake. Everybody gets bored at 11.59. I said, when you're bored, come back to our house. Mom and I will be upstairs. The house is yours. Watch movies here. Do whatever, but do it in our house. When Nick graduated from school, and the reason I'm sharing these techniques with you is this is how you achieve balance. You stay involved in life or you stay involved in work, but you have to have programs in place. When Nick, gradua when Nick graduated, uh, Anila turned 50 that same year from high school, and she got a trophy and I got a trophy, and the trophies were world's greatest Nick's mom and world's greatest Nick's dad. They were our graduation presents from the parents who said, thank you for allowing our children a home while we both had to work. So that's an option if you need to find friends, if you need to find colleagues. Here's the, here's the philosophical angle. Man was never designed for isolation. Suburbia is convenience, but it's not how we were designed. We were designed for community. The reason we are fighting these problems is we're doing it by ourselves. We were designed to lean on each other Find other families with same ideas, same mindset, do things together. We only have one boy. When we took him on a cruise with us, it would be not fair to him. Dragging him to have great memories is, like I go to Disney World, I've been there 40 times, I speak there a lot. I see all these parents, kids on a leash. <laughs> and parents, the kids spinning like a top in the heat and the parents can't believe they spawned that. Saying, oh, you have to have some fun. We spent $700 on this ticket. I can't believe everybody goes there to see Mickey and ends up acting goofy. <laughs> but when we went on a cruise, we said, Nick, which one of your friends do you want to go with you? You don't want to be with dad and mom alone in an ocean. You can't even get away from us. But his friends came from a single home. Friend is being raised by the mother. See, that's the ones we invested in. So I became the role model. I drove them everywhere. When there was an ice storm, I took off for four days and made sure the kids won't be bored because Anila won't drive on ice. Important stuff to do, right? All right, of all the groups, by far, you were the most recent. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>